Good afternoon to all of you. I thank uh, Professor Rajesh Kumar for this, uh, creating this occasion because uh, it's uh, by design I'm supposed to be there for some other program. It's by default that I'm here. And uh, this was meant to be basically to address most of you Though I never had a chance to meet, I did meet some of them, which I could identify in the class. Those who had come to Aligarh just a couple of months back, when we had organized an international symposium on linguistics across disciplines. And there was a good contingent that had come from IIT Kanpur also along with many other institutions across the country and outside. So since then, Rajesh had been thinking that we'll have some occasion to interact in a setup like this, because he has been talking about his accomplish accomplishments and his satisfaction that he has had so far while interacting with a young, bright students of the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT. And definitely, for any teacher, for any person, it's always a source of gratification that you do get a chance to meet with people who are thinking people, who are reflective people, who are going to talk to you who are at the same page. As Rajesh has already introduced me as a person who is mostly doing work while making linguistics as socially relevant. I'm a social linguist. My basic commitment is with regard to bringing a connect between what we do in the language practices in the class? And how do we translate those practices when we enter the field? What exactly the field gives us, inspires us to relook, to reflect upon the kind of things that we do in the classes and how much those things are really relevant when it comes to interacting, inter interacting with the living speakers, with the living language. Because many a time, our interaction in the classroom with the books is the interaction which is insulated from this kind of interaction with people at large. The recent work that I have been doing, I thought that I must share with you all but I would also like to bring still continuing work of mine, which is over for some reasons, as we have accomplished the task that was assigned to us. And that was the work that we did on Narmada tribes, particularly the two tribes, the Pauri speakers, the Pauras, and the Bhili speakers, the Bhil. Living in the Maharashtra region, who have been forcefully dislocated from their original habitats in the name of development, in the name of bringing prosperity to those people. And in the process of dislocation, what is happening is that they have and they are losing their culture, losing their language, and losing their socio-cultural practices that they have been used to having it all throughout. What prompted us to take up this project was basically my personal association because of my background of linguistics that we have been associated with 
NBA and we had two persons who were always source of inspiration for us. One, the most famous person, Medha Patka, and the other person who is not so famous, but equally a strong activist called Prabha Shinde. And because of this association that I personally had with them back when we were students at JNU, that influence impacted and that also enabled us to reach the terrain that was a difficult terrain. As a field linguist, you are, do, do not expect that, that there will be bed of roses for you every time. You really have to dirty your hands. You are coming down to the harsh reality where there is a possibility that you may not be able to meet three times food that you have been used to a day or even staying in a comfortable zone where most of us have been staying in the hostel or at home. But that is an experience. And that experience itself is very learning experience because it gives you a chance to understand what life is. And that is what we have graduated ourselves with. I'll talk about that experience later on. I'll defer it for the time being because my immediate preoccupation is working on two, again, language speakers who are, who are considered or are being basically listed as the speakers of endangered languages. One is Birhor. The Birhor, which is a language spoken by speakers with, according to 2001 census of India, had about 5,700 and odd number speakers. And they were not listed because you know that is a number which is not significant from the census point of view because they list only those languages where the speakers are 10,000 or more than 10,000 speakers. So anything that goes below that number is significant, has, is not there for the census. And there, there is a Chinali speaker, Birhor and Chinali. These are the two languages. Chinali, Birhor is an Austroasiatic language. And Chinali is, a Tibet, is an Indo-Aryan language. But Chinali stands for one unique, it has, it has a unique position. Because that's one language that still has a strong linguistic heritage with Sanskrit. We all claim as a kind of a nationalistic discourse that is there all over around us and as a kind of a nationalistic creation of a, of a, of, of a language that is there and we all believe that Sanskrit has very close proximity with Hindi has very close proximity with Sanskrit which is far apart in terms of grammar. Chinali has strong affinity with Sanskrit even today. So much so that if you look at Chinali being spoken, you'll realize that a, many of the forms, morphologically, syntactically, are the forms which have akinness to Sanskrit. But that is not what we are looking at because the job is not to look at the language, do a language study at a descriptive level. But the job is basically to document this language, the language which is not being spoken, so much so that it is not part of the scheme of census. And it is listed by the ethnologue and by the committee scheme for the preservation and protection of 
endangered languages that has been formed by the government of India as one of the endangered languages of India out of 540 that has been listed by the spell government of India scheme. So the job was basically to understand, to document this particular language, which is an endangered language. And we have been doing that job. The, the paraphernalia, the techniques, the principles that are involved in the documentation of language, we have been doing that, preparing a grammar for them, preparing a grammar in a particular mode which is required by the scheme so that there will be uniformity for all the endangered languages that are being worked at. And we are also documenting them in terms of the ethnosemantic domains. But as a social linguist, what primarily goaded me to look into that chenali was also what happens with the formation of identity of chenali. Part of it that I will take it up tomorrow in my presentation but part of, part of it, which I will not take it up there, I can share with you all. When I was working, and I am working with Chinali speakers, the Chinali speakers are the speakers who have shifted completely to Hindi. The Chinali as a heritage language is rarely used by people except for the domains of home. That's a very informal, private domain where they do speak. But they have a rich cultural heritage. And they are also carrying forward that heritage at a purely spoken level because it doesn't have any script. And that struck me because when we, had, we were interacting with Chinali people, we realized that the younger lot has completely distanced itself from the Chinali, but the elder generation, which is not specific to Chinali alone, I'm sure you are aware of this thing, that one of the criteria for determining what is endangered or extinct now is an intergenerational use of language. And that is very obvious because elder people of the community have been using it spoken form. The youngers do not. But what was striking about that is that those people who have been using it, there was somewhere in this scheme of Chinali's existence, they always had this a kind of a lurching, this lurking danger that it is going to disappear because it has lost its economic value, its sheen in the society, and its distinctive, distinctiveness that is there in terms of certain sounds that are peculiar to Stenali are not there because people have taken lock, stock and barrel the use of Hindi, which does not have those songs. And they have. As a result, they are, they are concerned that one should do. So with the initial hesitation from the community, which is very normal, that the community felt that why is it an outsider comes here and trying to do something for us. I mean, there, is, there must be something which is, a, which is a hidden agenda behind this benevolence. Because you don't be so benevolent without any purpose. And this is a situation which is very difficult for you as a linguist, you as a language expert, to overcome. Because you have to convince people that what 
has brought you before them is no ulterior motive. Ulterior motive in the sense of a political motive. But it's a purely and purely academic exercise that you are indulging in. And that is what you want to do. And that takes a lot of time to convince them. So collecting data with this kind of a suspicion is a very difficult task. But one has to overcome it. I'm sure you people are young, budding, emerging scholars. And at some stage of your life, you would have a desire to work on a language which you think that your contribution in working towards the language will at least give you a satisfaction that you are doing something for the society, not something for yourself alone. So this sharing, which we also had from our teachers, this sharing is something which all of us must be part of. So when we were able to overcome and reach the level of confidence from those people and became part of the member of the networked community which is there, then we were in a good zone of acceptability and we talked about a couple of things. And one of the things that really struck us was that they very forthrightly asked this question to me that, sir, ye batai, can you, I mean, you understand in Hindi if I say a little bit? There's no problem or should I continue in English? Continue in English. No problems. So they said, they told me, ki aap ye batai, ki chali, I understand ki aapka taat par rahe, aapka interest, your desire is basically do something for us. Baut achhi baat hai, aap kar rahe hai. I could see that for last one year you have been coming, visiting us. You have not indulged in any kind of a politicking. You have not indulged in any kind of things which are unpleasant for us. So, you think that you have a credibility. And you want to do something with us. What can you do for our script? Ke liye? This was a very point blank question that they asked me. And I had absolutely no answer. It is not that the linguistics has not equipped me to give an answer. But what has not prepared me is the society. Linguists, as a linguist, and what I draw, the knowledge from the subject linguistics, I know what I can do for the script. But as a member of the society, as a social linguist where I am involved in the relation between language and society, I know that that aspect prevents me from saying, giving any answer to that person's query as what I can do for his script. That was a strong moment for us, a moment of reflection. I came back with no answer. I was discussing with my team, then what do we do? The reason why I was discussing it, I could have brushed it aside. Ki farak penda, hamara interest thodi na hai unke script pa kaam karna. That is not my interest. I have to document the language. That is the mandate given to me by the government of India. That I have to document that language. I am doing the documentation. After that, I stop. Like in the, but in the back of my mind, there was something that, dis that was disturbing. That shall I stop here? I mean, isn't there any kind of an academic social responsibility that I have by being a member of the community that is an educated community? Isn't that academic social responsibility is it strong enough to compel me to at least ponder over this issue of what I can do to them in terms of a script and their anxiety for not having a script is an anxiety which is a strong base for the survival. It is not that they are not surviving now 
they are surviving. There is no script, they are surviving. But is this the survival that we talk about when we talk about a language being survived? These are the things that were really haunting me. It was not me alone, but my team that we were working. And finally, this summer, I called the person who was so genuinely concerned with the script in the entire interaction. I personally called him. I said that, Aap is chutti mein, as it is, you would like to come out from your extreme cold weather because Chinali is spoken in Himachal. Kulu, Manali, ke villages ke deep inside him. And you know that these are the difficult terrains during the peak winter that you have we witnessed in northern part of India. So I told him that if you have interest in that you have to do it, relatively come sardi jo hogi aap ke liye hamare liye to wo sardi hai bahut badi because in delhi and aligarh is no different the sardi in aligarh is something which is difficult for even person like rajesh to survive such at times because the treacherous weather is there it can always deceive you so we told them that if you want to come in relatively little sardi, if you want to come and stay with me, I'm calling you. Your stay is at my cost. Be with me. And I would like to discuss a couple of things with you as what really I can do for the script. Over which I was completely silent for so many months. And he was very happy about it and he came and stayed with me. And we had a long discussion over what we could do. That is what I want to share with you. If it really interests you. Otherwise I can move to some other experience of mine. Uh, if I take your silence as a positive note, then I can continue. Thank you very much. So, in which case, what, 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 did, what we did, see the, this linguistics tells you, Rajesh was, sometimes I can come out of the mics, can you hear me still? Because uh, the, this positioning always uh, distances you. And uh, as, a, as a teacher, it's always good to have this kind of a proximity being reduced a bit. Because this structure is always something which displays a power structure. So I was discussing this. I was what I had in my mind because uh, linguistics tells you, and what Rajesh was telling you all, you intend to do or you have to carry out your applied linguistics. So the linguistics tells you that you're not only concerned with what the linguistic forms are, you do do those things. In your elementary linguistics, you must have studied the forms of linguistics being studied at different levels. But you go beyond that when you enter into the realm of applied linguistics. You also look at how do these, social, these linguistic forms, they also create a social meaning. That is an important aspect. That is that these linguistic forms that you have, these linguistic forms to me are the forms that provide an index. I'm trying to take you to what a famous semiotician philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce has talked about. He has taken up the three categories index, icon, and symbol. I'm sure you people are familiar with what Fodenindi Sasir talks about as the two types, signifier and signified, which has really make a made a lot of dent across the discipline of linguistics. But 
equally and in fact I would say more powerful insights can be drawn from what Peirce talks about as icon, index and symbol. These are not the terms but these are strong categories that can bring you close to the social reality. When Peirce talks about an icon, oh, that icon is non nothing but the sign that brings you a meaning, that gives you a meaning because of resemblance. So if you have a map of India behind you, it is not India, but it resembles India. And the meaning that you create is what you have created from that map, which is an icon. That is the connection that you have with the linguistic form of map and the meaning. But when you have a connection, not with the form, with, not with the, with, the, with the resemblance, but with the convention, you call it as a symbol. But index is something which is an association. You have a connection because of the association. If I speak, and here, here where my interest suddenly began when I was thinking of, I'm still thinking of doing a work on script for Chinali. My interest began because when I was discussing with this, the, the person from, I do not like to name the person because that will be ethically wrong at this moment. Because there is one thing which we must observe is the ethics of research. So you don't reveal the name of a person. So one thing that struck me was that when he was talking about certain forms of his language, linguistic forms of a language, he was talking about those forms that were the peculiar forms which did not exist in Hindi. And they were bringing to you a lot of problems of misinterpretation and miscommunication. Even if you ask me towards the end of the things, tell us what those forms are, I will not divulge those forms right now because I'm going to reserve them for being more clear and doing something more, then I can bring it to the public domain. Because I'm still, it's still at the incubation stage where we are doing it doing for them. But I, I can draw parallel examples for you to understand, which will be equally well. When I'm talking about the linguistic forms, See, when you, when you say that there is a particular form which has an association and it gives you a particular meaning, let us take the form. You are all are familiar with what happens with the claim of speaking RP, receive pronunciation. You may dismiss it, you have people have dismissed it, fine. But you also have a notion of something which is a Queen's English, something which is a King's English, and something which is an RP, a received pronunciation. Leave aside the, the, the contentious part of it. What makes you become a speaker of non native sorry, a non-native speaker of English is do you make a vowel A as A or as A? That is something which is important. Because a native speaker would never say, I stayed at Aligarh or I stayed at, at Chennai, but he will say, I stayed at Aligarh or I stayed at a particular place. It's always A. And a native speaker will never say a single monophthong called O. He'll always have a diphthong, which is O. So for him, it is show. Show me the way to go home. It has never shown me the way to go home. But we are least perturbed with these things because we don't care for these things. But for people who, for, for whom this thing matters, it matters because these linguistic forms are indexical. These linguistic forms 
provide an index of their identity. A, a, a very famous uh, uh, anecdote or forget about that anecdote, I am sure you people have, uh, have been uh, listening to the commentaries and when somebody says instead of play or play, Tendulkar is or, or Virat is playing, I am sure you must have heard it. The, when a person says plying, you know that plying is not ply that you talk about. But ply is basically P-L-A-Y. But who says that? Do you say that? Do the British or American, Americans say that? No, they don't. It's an Australian speaker who says ply. So this linguistic form, it is an indexical of an identity of an Australian. We may look at it as something, we may brush it aside as something which is non, not very significant. But its significance is there for the people who use it. This is a, what something that, that was there when I started listening to the sounds that he was making. And when I started replacing those sounds with the normal Hindi sounds, and I asked him to say that and how he told me that this word with this sound means this. And if I say that, I'll be creating, I'll be becoming a cause of miscommunication. This is the indexical part of a language. A script is one such thing which is indexical. As I said, that linguistics did equip me, did provide a knowledge to me to understand how scripts can be devised. Always told me that, listen, it is not an easy venture that you can devise a script. This is where the applied linguistics becomes relevant for you because you, if you try to apply it straight away, your knowledge to what you, what you have done, to the, to the situation, then you have to cautious, very cautiously tread on the ground where the society is a living speaker of that living language. And you have to be very particular about that. Why is it that you have to be very, very cautious? It's, it's because the script that you say, that script is a bone of contestation is a site of struggle, political struggle for people. It is a script that has created a divide between people. And the script alone is not something which is, a, which is, which is a, a simply a moving figure on the pages of your notebook. A graphic representation of that figure which is devoid of any kind of a political or social or social potent that it has. It is not such an innocuous thing. It is laden with ideology. It is laden with politics. And that is the reason why applied linguistics becomes important because whatever you study as part of the knowledge of linguistics, apply it. But you apply it with the sensitivity of the place, of the community, of the situation in which it can be accepted. And this is what was there in the back of my mind when I was asking him about the script. I said that, what would you like this particular script that you want to have? to have a base. We are not going to bring, add a 15th script on the inventory of scripts that we have in India. As you all know, that we have 14 scripts in India. I say that we would, let's not make Chinali as uh, adding in that inventory and having a 15th one. That will be, no one will accept it. So we must think in terms of improvising it. And one way of improvisation is that you give me the sounds, 
you tell me what is that sound that is there and I am capturing those sounds by adding some diacritic markers. And I am working on and I am trying to associate that diacritic marker is a, is a, a form. And that diacritic marker is not a form for you. It is creating a meaning for you. It is not just a form. It is creating a meaning for you. And that meaning that it is creating is a meaning of your identity formation. This is something which is a very important aspect for you. For me, it's a stroke of a pen. But for you, this stroke of a pen is demolishing your identity. It is constructing your identity. For me, the demolition and construction of identity does not matter. I may wipe it out. But if you wipe it out, you are not wiping out that stroke of pen, but you are wiping out your existence, your identity. Would you like to do that? And if you agree to doing it, then in that case, in that case, you are not the only sole representative of the community. It has to be a participatory involvement of the people who speak that language. And this is where the, the entire process of revitalization of language comes. Because if you want to revitalize the language, the language which, has, which is on the brink of extinction, if you want to revitalize it, then you must have the consensus of the community. But as a democratic person, in a democratic society where you and I live, I am also conscious of the fact that we should not endeavor for emerging a consensus with no dissent. Because if there is no dissent, then that's, that's a community which is a dead community. There should be a dissent. And that it is the dissent that tells the vibrancy of the community. It is not the silence. And that is important for me. So for that purpose, we have identified the, 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 the period where I will be going and discussing with the community, but not alone. You will be surprised that that gentleman, I gave him a whole task to do. And I said that, okay, we'll slate it because I'm being selfish there. Like the way I made him become selfish of coming out of this such a difficult period of the season and being with me in Aligarh for one week, I also thought that we'll be selfish enough to go there during the best time of the season because Kulu Manali is the best time in June, May, June. And that is the time when we are also free from our academic responsibility. I teach in the university. And I have a responsibility of teaching, of doing all those things associated with the teaching. So that's, that's real. So the purpose of doing that at that period is, in between what he has, he has decided based on what I had asked him to do, and you'll be surprised that he has already held a community-wise meetings with people in different places. And giving this problem, and telling them what do they think about it. And a kind of a consensus that has emerged, and I, I, can, I can show you, I didn't bring it, to, uh, it is on, on, on I, can, I, I can show you next time, that these, these people have, held, have they had held a lot of meetings with the members of the community, and today their community is being asked to take up the task of having a script for them. For me, it is a one step forward in my responsibility as a, as a person engaged in a social, socially relevant linguistics that I am doing. Let me draw your 
let me share with an, with you people what I deferred at that time. This is a project that I had, uh, I have with two of my friends, colleagues, one from Deccan College, Pune, and the other is from Hyderabad Central University. Three of us are part of this project, one of the mega projects sanctioned by the UGC in the name of a multi varsity project. My colleague from Hyderabad is a well-known linguist, Professor Panchanan Mohanty, and another colleague from Deccan College is equally known social linguist, Professor Sulkar, Sonal Kulkarni Joshi. And three of us have been working on this project, basically trying to look into the loss of linguistic and cultural practices of the tribals, poverty and Bhili tribals, Bhili language speaker, tri speakers in Maharashtra. And this is, I'll just share with you people, some of them are published work, so there's no harm in sharing it also. And some of them are still in the process of getting published. So I'm, I'll also share that with you. See, when we went there, for the, this is an ethno-linguistic study. I'm sure you all know what is an ethno-linguistic study, where you try to connect yourself with the speakers, with, along with the nature, the ambience in which they live. So you're directly connected with the speakers, with the nature, the entire setting. So you are with them. We used to go there and spend a week with those tribals and we live with them behind the backwater of Narmada. It's a beautiful place. If at all you get chance, you must visit there. But reaching there is very difficult because you have to cut across a jungle and a particular point where you cannot go inside the jungle because the vehicles cannot go. So we, three of us, along with our team, would walk for about 10, 12 kilometers to reach a particular point. From there, one ferry will take us, that comes once in a day in the morning and drops you back again one particular fixed time in the evening. So if you want to go in between, you are not. You are completely stranded. But we had to do it. Because that is where we are doing our ethno-linguistic study. We did not go to the place initially where they have been resettled. They have been resettled in areas of Nandurbar, in Maharashtra. Some of you are from, if at all you are from Maharashtra, you are familiar with that place. It's, they, are, they, are, they have been relocated there. But when they were relocated 20 years ago, the younger generation decided to stay back because it had a lot of advantage. They were given a lot of money for leaving their houses that they used to stay on those hills. And why they were asked to, to get re relocated? Because the compulsion of building up higher dams would mean that they will be submerged. So the government said that you have a choice. Either you get yourself submerged or get yourself relocated. Of course, the government did not give the choice because that is not expected of a government. But they had a choice that they have to either stay back and if they stay back, they'll have a lot of problems because higher dam means the water flowing over the small, small hills where they are living. And if at all you have worked with the, with the, with the tribes, some of you may have, I do not know, any one of you has worked on the tribes, Rajesh, in your group? You have worked. Good. Some of them. Huh? Some of them are members of different tribes themselves. Wonderful. So you know that you know that their living habit is very different. We from different part of the world altogether, compared to the people who are 
living in that particular locale, we have a concept of a home where the home means that you have a sitting room, that is a drawing room, you have a bedroom, you have a kitchen and you have a place where you eat food and you also keep, keep your livestock away from the house. They are not supposed to be part of the house. But an entirely different ecosystem that works with these people, the tribes that we have been working, there is one house. The one house which locate, which, 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 in which the, 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 the couple lives and in the same house they will, they, the place, there is no dedicated place for, for sleeping, for eating, for cooking food and for keep, keeping the livestock. All these things are under one roof, no demarcation. So, Myself and my colleague Panchanan, we were to stay under the sky with the river of Narmada flowing below in the, on the hills outside the house. But our another colleague, Sonal Kulkarni Joshi, she had an acceptability to stay inside along with our female investigators, field workers who were there. And my male field workers were with us staying outside. We were, we used to stay there and what was uh, uh, early morning, I'm sure, uh, <clears throat> I'm familiar with, the, the, with the, the routine of some of my friends here who would like to go to bed at 4 in the morning and would like to get up at 12 at noon. But unlike that kind of uh, luxurious sleeping habits, the, the people over there, because they are close to nature, they are supposed to get up early in the morning at 4 or whatever the time may be and going to bed maximum by 7, 7.30 because there is no light. In fact, the first field work of mine had created a massive furor at my home because I had gone there and I did not realize, I did not tell my family that I am going to a place because I did not know about it myself, that I am going to a place where there is no connectivity. The telephone is not there, there are no mobile towers there, you cannot call anyone and God forbid if you have some emergency, you have got no vehicle to take you anywhere and that is the situation of our people living there and we are not concerned about that. This is the terrain. So when first visit of, of ours, of, of ours, for both, for all of us, it was a massive unrest at home because back home, the place where we belong to northern India, when you talk about working with the tribes, one imagination, one idea that you immediately construe about your working with the tribe is that I hope you are not made a captive by the Naxals. This is a very common perception that we have, that working with the tribes means that you are part of the Naxalites who are there. And once you are part of that Nexalite, everything is unsure. So that struck people at home. So that was the, 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 the thing, leave us, I mean. So when we got up, when we realized that in the morning, the, the lady of the house had gone to get milk from, they had buffaloes, they had cows and they had goats. And they had ox and all those things that are there, that is possible with chickens and everything. So when she had gone to get milk from the cow or from the buffalo, she had a small baby with her and she got the milk and in the, in the bucket where she got the milk, 
she gave the entire milk to the calf not to the child who was crying and accompanying the mother all throughout see as a as a social linguist and as an ethno linguistic study if i do please be clear that you have to have your perceptions very strong you must keep your eyes and your attention your gaze very alert must observe everything so we observed that she did not give the milk to her child and the child was crying it happened one day when the third day it happened then we asked the head of the family that why is it that the child is left without being fed or given a milk and every time the milk is given to a calf because that is our background we take milk from the from the buffalo or a, of a cow or a cow but did not give it back to them we give it to our people so this was something which was very unusual for person like us people like us so that person in a very innocent way he said q why do you say like that we had an interpreter who was interpreting so he asked this question in powari and uh, uh, he said q problem kya hai so we told him the problem is that the child was crying and the, the the child wanted to have milk that person said very very terse reply he said ye dud uske liye nahi hai that was a shocking thing for people coming from this part of the world because ye dud uske liye nahi hai means that ye dud is only meant for that from the souls not for us but that was a, that was something that triggered off to us and we started looking up we realized that in the language of the spavadi and bheeli language particularly at that time we were talking about pavadi in that language there is no word for milk that was very surprising the only thing that they have is an equivalent that you call in hindi or dood there is no pavadi word for milk and that was very intriguing so we asked those people ki aap doodh ko kya karte hain they said kuch nahi i said acha we were not served tea and that is one thing where perhaps uh, people like us who have been living on 20 25 cups of tea every day would have a thousand deaths so this was a, the thing that was difficult so of course we had to adjust to that okay i'll stop it so what happens like we realize that there is no word for milk and the reason that they have no word for milk again triggered off one in, one interesting factor that they have an aversion to milk they have got no word for milk product nothing at all and that made us realize that pavara tribe which has been all throughout by the linguists considered to be an indo-aryan language because it has been subsumed under bheel and bheel is a indo-aryan language and pavara has been subsumed under bheel we realize along with the observation on the milk that there is a munda substratum of the pavara though they have come to down south they have a munda austroasiatic substratum because in austroasiatic languages also they don't have words for milk and another thing that really justified our 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 thinking of the munda strap substratum and we published it also is that they have in in their language narmada sharda taloda you know this da ending the suffix da etymologically the suffix da means narm soft this means narm so you have the da even in in the in the in the uh, uh, austroasiatic belt even the ground till bihar you have uh, sialda malda when you look at the da ending 
the da ending is again and as a, as again a munda base all these couple of these things it prompted us to come forward with a with a with a with our claim that the pavda and the pavdi language has a munda substratum we published it i'll stop it now so uh, no so from what uh, the economic part is so would that have any bearing on the fact that they uh, they have given up this language yeah yeah that is very strong okay. that is very strong because they have no compunctions so they prospered after coming they have prospered and they have, they have a, i mean they, they feel that there is nothing wrong in that okay. but now with the return right. of the script I do anticipate. Passion you have in your work, especially for tribes which are very much unknown and endangered. I wish the same passion and is being taken up by linguists to study languages of uh, some no, uh, northeast India, particularly Manipur. <laughs> I wish. Uh, no, I think there are people who are there are people who are doing it. I don't think I am the only person. There are many people who are doing it. So, perhaps you may not have uh, contacted them or met them, maybe. But one thing is very uh, the uh, though I should not uh, say it, but uh, we must say it because we represent different kind of a world altogether. That uh, for most of these languages, the white-skinned people are more passionate for other reasons. and at times it happens that you try to work for example when we try to look up this particular thing of munda substratum we thought that we must publish it because we immediately had heard something that the the summer institute of linguistics summer institute of science yes yeah, summer institute of linguistics has given a massive project to per people to work on on uh, pavri for looking to the substratum of munda and i thought that before our work gets away and they take the credit we must publish it and that is one thing that i would request all of you who are doing it that don't let your work go unpublished because you do a lot of hard work and someone else takes the cake this is this is important for us i am not saying it from a nationalistic fervor point of view but i am saying it from the academic honesty point of view that you don't get recognized or even if you are recognized you are recognized as a margin as a footnote and you know what the status of footnote is research on this the the the, 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 the words which have uh, which are indexical which are indexical yes, yes, yes. of, of uh, identity and all mm-hmm. that actually enlightens me to think about my uh, my work where i i i work on kokboro which has been under the influence of uh, of of the of, of bangla in the indian language which is very dominant in that uh, in that area it has uh, import, imported lots of structures from uh, bangla i sometimes i don't have some answers syntactic answers to uh, those uh, those features which sometimes fall out of uh, syntactic rules you know i this is what has enlightened me to think uh, maybe there are some uh, social linguistic uh, indexical if uh, if a bit of it has made a dent on you i'm yeah. really happy about that <laughs> i think that uh, at least my mission of sharing with you all is yes. accomplished thank you but i'll suggest that you look up uh, what rajesh has recently brought out a book linguistic formation linguistic foundation of identity and uh, uh, it has a couple of articles i'm not s- making uh, uh, a kind of a salesman job for that book <laughs> but uh, it is uh, it has a couple of articles and some of the articles may be of relevance for you